Hi, this is Alex, and if you love music, well, you've come to the right place because we're all about albums. We all know what live music sounds like. In fact, when we're walking down the street past an apartment with the window open and we hear music coming out of it, we instantly know if that's a recording or if there's actually a person playing that musical instrument live. In fact, the definition of the best sound quality, which is given the term the absolute sound, is that of what unamplified acoustic instruments would sound like. However, when I was young and starting to get into music, I hated live albums. I loved the studio albums way more. Why? Probably because I was used to it. That's what I would hear on the radio. And so I would love to hear the band sound at their best, which meant them in the studio. My friends and I thought that the band was great at a live show if they sounded the most like the album that we own. In fact, I remember the first time I saw Squeeze, a friend turned to me and said, gee, Squeeze is absolutely great. They sound just like their album. Boy, thinking about that back now, I just shudder. Now I feel just the opposite. That's probably why I'm getting more and more into jazz music. Many times jazz music was recorded, especially from the 1950s and 1960s, with the band playing all together in a studio. Additionally, the recording engineers back in the day had great talent in knowing exactly where to place the microphones. Also, they had some of the old style microphones uh, that were analog based and have a very live sound. And sometimes you get a fantastic album, just like the Miles Davis album, Kind of Blue, where the musicians all played together and pretty much every song was done on the first take. These are the types of albums that I connect the most to now and that I love the most. In fact, the only live albums I enjoyed were the ones that were played on the radio. Those included Bob Seger's album Live Bullet, as well as Frampton Comes Alive. In fact, I enjoyed the live versions of these songs better than the studio versions, and that is likely related to the fact that this is what I was used to. This is what I heard every day on the radio. So here are my picks for my favorite live albums of all time. Now, this is not a comprehensive list, there are many great other live albums out there, but I'm just going to tell you the ones that I love the most. I will not rank these albums. I'll just merely present you these albums in chronological order, but I will tell you which is my favorite live album. Well, first up, we go back to 1959, and this is on the RCA Victor label and is Belafonte at Carnegie Hall. Back in the day, Harry Belafonte was just about the biggest entertainer in the whole world. In fact, this album is considered by many as one of the greatest live sounding albums. It sounds so real, people use this as a demo recording many times. This album was recorded over uh, two days of shows at Carnegie Hall, and this album did so well it stayed on the charts for three years. The songs on this album include many of his best known songs, including an 11 minute version of Matilda with audience participation. Next up, we go to 1966 and we have Sinatra at the Sands. Sinatra was accompanied on this album by Count Basie and his orchestra. And this album was conducted and arranged by none other than Quincy Jones. One of the reasons I love this album so much is, unfortunately, I never was old enough to see Frank Sinatra in his heyday, and this album really gives you a good glimpse into what a great entertainer Frank really was. 
For those collectors out there, you should know that there is a Mobile Fidelity version of this album, and it does have indeed great sound. Also, there is a second album, which is just the Count Basie Orchestra performing at the Sands that night without Frank singing. Next, we move on to 1969, where we follow this band in their 1969 tour, and we have one of the great live rock and roll albums, Get Your Yayas Out, and yes, that is the great rock band, The Rolling Stones. This is at a time where the band was featuring Mick Taylor on guitar. One of the great reasons to own this album is it shows the world's greatest rock and roll band in their peak. At this time, they were just before they were about to release Beggar's Banquet and the great Let It Bleed. And not only after that, they come up with Sticky Fingers and Exile on Main Street. So you're seeing the band here at their ascent to superstardom. Next, we move ahead only one year to 1971, where we get the great album Live at Leeds. And this is The Who on their first live album where they were performing at Leeds University. This album truly shows what a great rock band should and could sound like. Many critics consider this the greatest rock and roll live album of all time. What's interesting to note is that this album actually was just released as a fill-in album. This album that was released of Live at Leeds was the album that came right after Tommy, but before the band went back to the studio to record some of their greatest music. The album art cover is kind of cool. It looks like a bootleg album cover. Additionally, what's interesting is this album only contains six songs originally when it was first released. However, then in 1995, it was re-released, and at that time there were 14 songs from the album, and then later on there was, in 2001, another release of this album, and this time they not only included those 14 songs from the concert, but also their performance of the rock opera Tommy. And now we're in 1971, and we have the great album at Fillmore East. And yes, for those live album buffs out there, this is an easy one. Maybe the greatest some people put of all time. And this is the Allman Brothers. This is a live album that came after their first two albums were released. This, you're seeing the band at its most creative, and you are seeing Dwayne Allman perform fantastic uh, uh, riffs and slide guitar as you've never heard the guitar played before. The release of this album brought the band many new fans and made the band into stars. A few interesting facts. First of all, this is the first Allman Brothers album to go platinum, and it was live. And uh, secondly, many people consider this on the list of one of the greatest albums of all time, not only live, but any album in rock music ever released. And now we move forward to 1972, where we have the album entitled Europe 72. Yes, this is the recording of the Grateful Dead during their European tour during 1972. This was released as a triple album, and this was the first triple album to reach gold status. And this, to this day, is one of the Grateful Dead's best-selling albums. In fact, this album has sold over two million copies. Next, we jump forward to 1976, and we talk about an album that I have already mentioned, and that is Live Bullet. That's Bob Seger and the Silver Bullet Band. This album, when it was released, finally brought uh, Bob Seger to national attention. He was popular only regionally in the Detroit area, but after this album, he was known worldwide. This album shows Bob Seger as his creative best and really shows a lot of energy 
in this live concert performance. In fact, this is ranked number 26 on the 50 greatest live rock albums of all time by the Rolling Stone magazine. This album peaked to number 34 on the Billboard charts in 1976 and went platinum in 1977. This album has become one of the classic rock albums. Next, we move forward a couple of years to 1978, where we have one of my personal favorite live albums, and that is Waiting for Columbus by the band Little Feet. This was the first live album for the band, and what was great about it, it did actually capture the energy that they brought to their live shows. Also added to this was the intense uh, nature of the horn section on this album brought to you by none other than the Tower of Power. Most of the songs featured on this album are some of their best known songs, although these are extended jam versions of the songs, much like what you would find with The Grateful Dead. This album peaked number 18 on the US Billboard chart. And for those of you lucky enough to own it or to find it, Mobile Fidelity has issued uh, this album twice. Next, we move to 1984 and we have the great band, The Talking Heads. And this was not only a live album, this was also released as a video movie. And this is called Stop Making Sense. Now, what's interesting about this album is although it contained the songs from the movie, the album was presented not in the same order of the video. And I would say that that really was tragic. Reasoning is that David Byrne, the leader of the Talking Heads, he presented this album in a specific orderly sequence. For those of you who have seen the movie, Stop Making Sense, you know what I'm talking about. For those of you who are not familiar with the movie, what they did was is David Byrne was featured on the first song and on every subsequent song, one more band member was introduced to the song. Finally, not only did we have the whole band, subsequent songs featured not only the whole band, but a large rhythm section. So we get a large, powerful, energetic sound. And this was how the album progressed. Now, luckily, later on, this album was re-released in the proper chronologic order of the original concert. This album peaked at number 41 on the Billboard 200 LP list. Next, we jump an entire decade to 1994, where we have the album Unplugged in New York. And yes, most of you know this already before I'm going to say it. It is the concert performance of a lifetime by Nirvana. This concert first aired on MTV on November 18th, 1993. Now, this concert performance was the first one that MTV allowed to have the amplified uh, music as Kurt Cobain insisted that his guitar be plugged into an amplifier and he was given the okay. This is the first album released after Kurt Cobain's unfortunate death. And this album did reach number one. And not only that, this album made it eight times platinum. What's unique about this album is that the band performed all 14 songs in a single take. Also, it's the first band to record other artists' songs, most notably the David Bowie uh, hit song, The Man Who Sold the World. This album is highly regarded by critics. And not only that, many of the critics felt that the style that Kurt Cobain was using for this performance was likely the style that would keep evolving and probably revolutionize the sound of acoustic folk music. Not only was this album heartfelt, but this is a very intimate performance by Kurt Cobain and his band. And we have the album Live at Blues Alley, which came out in 1996. 
and that is by Eva Cassidy. And if for those of you who know my previous videos, I put Eva as my number six greatest female singer of all time. For those of you who don't know who Eva Cassidy is, you should check out this album or any of her other discography. Eva had a very loyal following in DC, was pretty much unknown other than the DC area. She played many local uh, pubs and bars. And in 1996, she on her own spent her own money and recorded two nights in January of 1996 at the jazz club Blues Alley. Eva sang many standards and made them her own and she also sang some uh, contemporary pop songs as well. Unfortunately, later in 1996, Eva died from cancer and she was not alive long enough to see how successful her career would become both nationally and internationally. Eva made all the songs her own and in fact, Sting song Fields of Gold is considered by many one of the greatest performances for a cover song. In fact, that song is used at many high-end stereo stores and audio shows to show off their equipment. In 2015, for the 20th anniversary, they re-released this album, but this time they released all the songs that were performed that evening. The original album contained only 13 songs she performed, whereas I believe there were 34 songs or 33 songs uh, that were uh, released and performed by her on the album entitled Nightbird. Now, I told you I would tell you what my favorite live album is, and it's this one. So if you're gonna buy a live album and you love a great female vocalist, look no further than this album, Live at Blues Alley, or the 20th anniversary album, Nightbird by Eva Cassidy. And last but not least, we move forward to 2002 with the album entitled Live in Paris. And yes, this is Diana Krall. This album features the intimate voice of Diana, as well as her outstanding supporting band. She liked to sing American standards, as well as include a few modern day pop songs. In fact, this album featured Joni Mitchell's A Case of You from her Blue album and Billy Joel's great hit song, Just The Way You Are. This album really gives you a great understanding of what a live performance by Diana would sound like. This is actually a fantastic sounding album and I believe the vinyl was re-released not that long ago, so you can probably still pick up this album. It has great quality sound. You won't be disappointed. And for those of you who want to sort of get into jazz maybe a little bit, this is a very accessible album. And I highly recommend it. So if you want to be introduced to Diana Krall, you should pick up Live in Paris. And in fact, many people would say this may be the only album you need by Diana Krall. Fun fact, I know many of you out there know this fact already, but for those of you who don't, you may be surprised to know that Diana Krall is married to Elvis Costello. I kid you not. And now for last video's unknown album. The first unknown album came out in 1973. This album is by the Allman Brothers entitled Brothers and Sisters. Now this is the first album that came after Eat a Peach and this album does not feature Dwayne Allman as he had died towards the end of the recording of the Eat a Peach album. This album had the new lineup which featured uh, Chuck Lavelle on keyboards and Lamar Williams on bass. This album is not as hard rocking as the previous albums. In fact, it was a very melodic and beautiful sounding album, but this album also showed that the band can not only survive the untimely death of the great Dwayne Allman, but also the band member Barry Oakley. In case of you wondering who is on the cover, the cover photo is that of Valor Trucks, and that is the song of the drummer Butch Trucks. This album had a positive response by the critics, 
and this album did reach number one on the Billboard's LP list and it sold over one million copies. And the next unknown album, and I know both unknown albums were pretty easy as a lot of viewers indicated to me on the last video, and uh, that is Forever Changes, one of the great albums from 1967 by Love. And actually the album is really entitled Love Forever Changes by the album Love, even though most people call it Forever Changes. This may be the most brilliant and enduring album to come out of the Summer of Love in 1967. This was the band's third studio album, and this is different than the prior two albums, which were more hard rocking albums. This album was more psychedelic and softer and melodic sounding. This comes from the great songwriting duo of Arthur Lee and Brian McLean. Unfortunately, there was a lot of strife with the band during the recording of this album. And after this album was recorded, uh, Brian uh, McLean left the band and Albert Lee did a cleaning of the, most of the remaining members as well after the album was released. The album was more folk sounding with uh, acoustic sound. And the themes of this album were a little bit more mature and darker themes it sort of gave up the uh, altruistic view of the world and rather started seeing what was coming, almost predicting the unrest coming in 1968 and 1969 with both political uh, changes as well as the Vietnam War. This album uh, is ranked number 180 on the Rolling Stone 500 Greatest Albums of All Time. This album early on uh, did not do commercially well. It only reached number 154 on the US charts, although did reach number 24 on the UK charts. This album later on was considered one of the truly great albums from the 1960s, and many bands turned to this album for inspiration. And now for last video's Unknown Albums, the first Unknown Album. Okay, hope you got that one. The second unknown album. Great, hope you got that one too. As always, if you think you know the answer to the unknown albums, please let me know in the comment sections below and I'll let you know how you did. As always, this is Alex with All About Albums. Thanks for listening. Have a great day. And remember, keep them spinning.